We next have the keynote by Ashu Siyash, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer Kresil, and also one of the most powerful women in the financial services industry. <laughs> Her keynote is on Agile Leadership 101, Unlearn to Succeed. Ms. Ashu, please. Good morning. Good morning. It's most humbling to be here today. Uh, I want to start with some disclaimers. Uh, and I guess in the role that I do, uh, which is all about uh, data analytics and insights, uh, putting data out uh, is necessary because otherwise the insights and analytics will be of no value. And the simple data point is I'm not an agile expert. Okay, so I do want to set your expectations. Uh, but I know being agile and agility is actually central to survival. And uh, in the course of the next 40 odd minutes, uh, I'm going to share with you agility the way I see it as a business leader. Uh, my experience over the years, and uh, I've completed over 30 years, uh, and uh, hopefully there will be some insights and uh, hopefully most of you could take back something and apply it at work and if not at work in life because i think that's that is the larger uh, canvas we often lose the plot uh, limiting ourselves and uh, thinking of uh, a lot of these concepts and applying it in a very narrow way to work which is just one part of overall uh, life. Uh, so I'm going to try and talk about uh, the relationship of change with agility and, like I said, business and life. The what, how, and why, the way I see it, the way I've experienced it across the several organizations that I worked for, why I believe that agility cannot come forth without unlearning. And, you know, the five steps, and I call uh, agile leadership, actually leadership 101, because it is as basic. And, and uh, you know, I uh, listened to the previous speaker very attentive, uh, attentively, and I realized that there is so much more that I can learn, and maybe in that learning I might unlearn something, so that's, <laughs> that's why there's a little bit of reinforcement. And most importantly, uh, impact. And uh, I hope to share that impact with you through case studies that I've seen and of my current organization. Because Today, I, I have the privilege to be before you because of the role I do and not because of who I am. And that's something that is also a very important data point that I want to uh, lay out for you. So, you know, I guess nobody here will disagree that the world is transforming. And uh, I find it always very useful to look at transformation in an experiential way. And in that context, you know, there is this data out there that I found fascinating. You know, in today's day and age, who would call airlines as transformational? We kind of take it for granted. But if you look at it from the lens of how long did it take this particular innovation or what was seen as transformation several, several decades ago to hit 50 million consumers, I think it begins to put things into perspective. 
and then of course the car and and you know the telephone and i don't want to get back to alexander graham bell and all of that <laughs> because all of you have uh, read all of that but you know couple of very important things and we are in india and uh, i won't forget uh how long it took for the telephone to come home between the promise that my dad had said that we will have a telephone at home and when it arrived <laughs> right and for several of you that is unthinkable today right because we have the cell phone so when you think of the phone of 50 years and you think of the cell phone of 12 years it puts a lot of things into perspective and you know if anybody was relocating uh, uh, places uh, getting that phone line and i remember i moved from bangalore where i grew up to mumbai uh, i thought you know bigger city better ways but guess what it still took forever for that phone to land home and then of course i remember uh, when the cell phone was launched in india it took like a day and that felt like power that felt <laughs> very empowering and then when i think about uh, music i think about how delightful radio was and then when we got the tape recorder and you know there was this big thing to save up to buy cassettes and then when i think of the ipod my god that was transformational and today with apple with itunes with all that you can download and you know along the way one shouldn't forget of the number of companies that kind of have been done with in the course of this uh, world's transformation and you know talking about music uh, and thinking about uh, sony and uh, what the arrival of walkman did to a lot of things and what the arrival of ipod did to sony i think is a well understood uh, case study but with facebook reaching 50 million uh, users or consumers in 3 years and then twitter 2 years and then i you know close this slide with pokemon go how many of you played this okay I'm glad to see only few because this is dead. <laughs> but I can tell you I kind of lived through a couple of days of immense soul searching because my uh, younger daughter you know one day did ask me do you know Pokemon Go it's like that big thing and she tried explaining it to me and I just couldn't fathom this fascination and between her explaining it to me i went to the us and i was shocked to see people crossing the road with this and i said my god the human race will die <laughs> if this takes over thank god the human race has survived and pokemon go <laughs> is dead but it does tell you that you know in case of pokemon it's by the way not 19 years that's a typo it's 19 days it took to read uh, reach 50 million consumers and then it just took a couple of months to die and i i guess the simple takeaway in all of this is transformation and change is so embedded and survival is key right that's for all the stuff out there in the slide and most importantly for all of us very closely linked to this transformation and change that we are seeing is several trends that i think are rewriting the world of business the world per se and that's the way i look at it I'm truly fascinated by the role of technology on all of this. And I do recognize then that my earliest memory of the term agile was in the context of software development or coding. 
uh, I kind of understood only maybe a couple of years ago, that's also about leadership. And I, I want to draw that connection and link here. Uh, you know, coders were not always agile. They would take forever to deliver against the business requirements. And guess what? By the time they delivered an organization's or teams tested, the requirements are changed. And by the way, I think in the context of survival, that fraternity decided that they needed to do things a different way. And that's, to my mind, how the concept of agile came to the fore. This may not be the textbook case, but this is the way I've experienced it. And I go back to the data that I put out there to say I'm not an agile expert. But in that context, what's so relevant is at one time, business requirements were converted by a set of coders to an application that was deployed and that people like me end, in, end up using. But today, that whole process of what somebody wants, what somebody wants to decide, the process to arrive at the outcome is being taught to the machine, which is then throwing up answers faster than you and I can imagine. Uh, there are several examples, but you know, there are a couple that I have seen in my career. And in the last three years, the kind of change that AI and machine learning has brought about is incredible. One of the top five banks on Wall Street, their entire cash equities business, which supported almost 20,000 traders overnight, two, two and a half years ago with the advent of algo trading, were down to a handful. That's like a multi-billion dollar business for this bank. Right? Chatbots have replaced customer service people across the world. And that's going to be a $7 billion industry. I know for a fact that legal firms no longer want to work with interns. They've cut down the number of lawyers they employ because they're able to teach the machine, get a summary of all the relevant cases, the probability of how a judgment in court may be pronounced, right? So think about it, you know, what this trend is doing and what it means for you and me and why agility is so important. The second big trend is the concept of an ecosystem. You know, I grew up learning that it's all about competing. You know, when you are in school, college, you compete and, and that's how you kind of grow and that's how you make it to the top of the class. And that's what happened. And, and in my career, you know, I worked with Citibank, I worked with Fidelity, I worked with the LNT Group, and now I run Crystal. And it's a, a kind of a very, very different uh, set of organizations. I mean, Citibank was competing with JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, HSBC, and all of that. But what I started finding two, three years ago is competitors come together to co-create and develop an ecosystem. And I'll tell you, this is born out of the global financial crisis. Because up until the global financial crisis, which is 2008, it was all about competing to make those billions of dollars. When the crash happened, the big recognition was we all knew the problems. 
but we were so busy competing that we make, missed fixing the problem. And you know what? The global financial crisis changed the way the financial services industry has operated forever. And by the way, the impact of that change is still happening. And ecosystems were born out of that because it gets people to come together, to think about it. And I linked this back to the way I see agility and why ecosystem or teams or co-creation, sharing, coming up with the solution collectively, cohesively, collaboratively is so important. You know, I love the startup environment. And, and I'll, t I'll submit very humbly to you why startups survive and why startups fail. Okay, it's a personal point of view. Startups survive, thrive, and become who they are. I mean, Amazon was a startup. Can anybody call Amazon a startup today? But it was, right? Let's, let's just face it. That's because there was no burden of the past. You know, we are all prisoners of the past. And uh, the second thing is generally, uh, not 100% of the time, and that kind of tells you something, startups are done by young people. And these days it's about people who are 12, 13, 14, 15, 20s. If you're 30 and you're saying, I'm going to start up, people look at you and laugh, actually. And again, it's this because they are not the prisoner of the past. They don't have to unlearn. They only have to learn and relearn. Whereas for everybody else, it's a very, very painful journey. And that's why the millennial workforce is changing the way companies think and behave. It's forcing leaders and people like me to start asking the question, I've done things in a particular way because I experienced it from my manager, from the various organizations, but I have people coming and telling me in interviews, I want your job in three years. And I'm saying, my friend, I took 30 years. And then I catch myself saying, you know, that's not the right thing. There is a faster, quicker, better way of getting there. And there's nothing that suggests that you need to make this very vibrant workforce, this very fertile mind, a prisoner of the way I think or the way traditional companies think. Because they are testing and that's how concepts like flexible work environment, flex ER and you know, why should I only eat at lunch and you know, why should I actually sleep in the night? Why can't I work through the night and stay up through the day is happening? But you know what, what this very subtle change is doing is it's actually breaking down walls and boundaries and giving freedom a new dimension. Because from that concept, new ideas are being born. And there's very close linkage to the millennial workforce, to the startup world, to how companies that are thriving, who are traditional, but are going through a dramatic shift, are doing well, and that's something about how leaders are also adapting to this change. You know, when I think about the world of payments, how many of you have either pay, pay, Paytm or Mobi Quick or some wallet on your phone? Basically 100%, right? How do you think of banking? How often do any of you go to the bank to give a check which then gets credited into somebody else's account? No, I've been a banker for 16 years. <laughs> you know, I somewhere ask myself, through those 16 years, what was I doing? I'm sure State Bank of India, which is like a banker to almost every Indian, is asking that question when they think about Paytm. 
it's rewritten the rules. When I think about Aadhaar and I think about what it's done uh, to getting or equalizing the ability of somebody, you know, Jumri Talaya is a very fav favorite thing when people speak because nobody knows where it is. <laughs> and then you think of Bombay, but it just equalizes somebody staying there and somebody staying here, right? In terms of access. And that's exactly what even the e-commerce world has done. There is no reason for somebody living in the villages of Mumbai not to have the same products as people here experience. And, well, that's transformation. That's a trend. That change train has left. I want to take a minute on this alternative data point and the way I see uh, geopolitics playing out. You know, I'm not sure there needs to be a divide between data and alternative data. I mean, what the hell? Both are data points. Right? But the term has caught on so much because it's a way of challenging the traditional. And in my business and in my world, where we do so much of forecasting, because, you know, whether it's our ratings business or research, you know, we talk about the way things are going to unfold by looking at a lot of historical data. But, you know, sometimes it's important to take the here and now to make those forecasts accurate. You know, waiting for sales forecasts don't give you a quick, real-time forecast or assessment. And the most talked about study is Starbucks, right? I do not know how many of you know, but, you know, there's a lot written about their culture, etc. But from... A you know, a buy on a stock perspective, one of the big waves that caught on for this stock is where some smart analyst was just tracking customer sentiment on the internet. And by the way, this analyst was laid off and had spent that time because no job, so spending all the time between Facebook and internet and realized that there was a massive change. Now that was of course then explained as, you know, customer first, thinking about what, what the consumer is doing and all of that kind of stuff. But that early change was, well, consumers had started noticing the way Starbucks was looking at its consumers and that drove preferences and then of course it's a massive story. We live in a a uh, world where geopolitics has taken on a very different dimension. And uh, the one thought that I want to leave you here before I move to the next slide is, I think if I looked at 100 years, the first 50 years was all about how economies looked at their domestic markets. It was all, of, if I look at India, it was the whole Swadeshi movement because we were coming out of uh, the whole colonial rule and it was about getting the industries, uh, you know, producing for India and, you know, creating that whole uh, economic stability for the country because, you know, you needed that to be able to survive, right? Then, of course, to my mind, the next 50 was all about globalization. Because then it was like the world is the playground. I mean, if you think about the most recent trend, it's about protectionism, right? I mean, you talk about the US-China trade war. My only take is call it by what you want, but it's a bit of going back. And we'll have to see what this unfolds and how it's going to uh, impact companies, businesses, leaders, people, but the change train has left the station. So, I guess it's stating the obvious, right? Nothing is permanent in the world except change. 
it is the only constant actually it is what drives innovation because any journey is called a journey because it's not about from where you start to where you go but everything in between and that everything in between is where a lot of learning is probably there some unlearning some relearning and we'll talk about it and it is that awareness that self awareness and i know my uh, the previous speaker touched upon some of that uh, is so crucial and end of the day every event if classified into an opportunity or a threat will actually come in the way of progress because you will not learn from either the opportunity or threat and progress and it's so important and the term vuka has been overdone these days uh, i'm sure all of you know v is volatile use uncertainty is complex and ambiguous but you know what in my book it's always been a vuka world that's why i, I love this charles darwin quote because i think it's so relevant so my friends agility is not new right the quote is about it's not the strongest of the species that survive not the most intelligent but the most adapt adaptive right that's why the dinosaur is history the lizard is still around and i'm very scared of them and the cockroach i actually call this the cockroach theory by the way i know there is that other uh, i i'm not like a management person i'm a very boring ca so i have to learn differently right to me cockroach th cockroach theory is this charles darwin thing because that cockroach look at the size and look at its survival but it it's food for thought right i mean we shouldn't rubbish away things that one is scared of like i am so end of the day uh, sorry to make it sound so dumb in such an important event around agility it's actually nothing but adaptability but in a lot of ways and that's why to me it's all 101 right uh, you know all said and done it's about speed precision nimbleness it's so much so in daily life it's so much so in business it's so much so as how each one of us think leadership cannot be seen in isolation it has to be seen in the context of the person and the business managed and somewhere we tend to think about these three things as as separate and uh, to my mind agility and practice is to really convert some of this very simple stuff and to adopt it adopt it to become adaptive right and uh, that's part of the reason i completely agree about it being an inside job response to change is an inside job because that response comes from within and uh, in a very very simple way that's also the start point of becoming adaptive of becoming agile and in the context of business the tone has to be set at the very top because otherwise there is no incentive there is no motivation for the rest of the organization uh, to become agile and to my mind uh, i in, in my own organization talk about it as to survive sometimes we should be honest right we, we don't know the next new i mean there will be some other crystal somewhere so who knows some young kid don't know whether it's 24 or 14 is creating something uh, so you know one should just be very very uh, aware of some of this uh, so i think couple of very important things and i am stating the obvious uh to me the biggest danger 
is about we've always done it this way. Uh, people call it mindset. It's called culture. To me, it's the enmity. It is the enemy. This is actually what most of us compete with, by the way. Right? Anybody who said business is predictable, perhaps it was long back. Maybe I experienced it in the first couple of years of my work life. Because, you know, I had a boss who told me that your job is to manage these three relationships. Banking, right? So I was about demand drafts, by the way. My, my first one year and I, I don't even want to ex I, I kind of feel a little embarrassed having asked you the question around uh, Paytm and Wallet and PayPal. Imagine demand drafts. <laughs> and I spent a whole year in that role. Managing three banks. Uh, well, good evidence of why businesses cannot be run around scripted lines. And because it cannot be run around scripted lines, it's so very important to have dynamism across. It's not just about the leadership uh, model. And there has to be uh, almost a culture on how do you move quickly, speed. Can you imagine, would anybody either run a marathon or win a race if speed was not of the essence? So it's the same about winning in business or winning in life. And to my mind, the, you know, there, there is this internal debate that I go through when things like traditional leadership Stifle, and I've written it, right? Stifle uh, creativity and impairs managerial effectiveness. And I'm almost cringing as I talk about it because it almost seems like telling all of you that everything that is traditional should be chucked. That's not the key message. The key message is don't get hung up about the way you did things in the past or the way... You know, your previous boss told you, or in my case, as I stepped into my role as CEO at Crystal, and I took over for, from somebody who had been in the company for 22 years. So everybody told me how I should do my job as CEO. And then I said, okay, uh, what do I do now? And I remember my first day in the company and they asked me, so how does it feel? I said, you know, my brain is quite empty. Uh, before coming in, I have done a control all delete because I have not come from this industry. And now I will listen and learn and uh, we will win together. And to my mind, that is very important. And there is something to be said about behavior here because unless you have Either the humility, the authenticity, just the grace to accept that you don't know at all, you will not progress. And uh, that's true for all levels, by the way. It's not just at the top. And that's why I very firmly believe that we live today where CEOs should not be measured only by revenues and profits because that is of the year that is going. Tomorrow, in this fast-paced changing world, you have to spend as much of time, money, effort, attention on that next new and in that next new, some things will succeed and some things will not. It's about a, the day and age is about failing fast because failing slowly is very expensive. And that's a very key aspect of agility. It's also very closely linked from unlearning. You know, on a, it's so natural when it's your idea. You, you spend all your time trying to make it succeed. Though you very well know it's done its time. And that's where unlearning uh, comes in.
and you know these nice cartoons are uh, you know very simple way of bringing out how to be agile and how not to be agile and in a very simple way agile fails when you cannot let go If as an individual you can't let go of some of your burdens then your ability to do well in life is hugely compromised your ability as a manager to not being able to let go of you know the way you've done things in the past will not allow you to embrace the new and as a leader you know leaders set the culture right and it's so normal to say in my organization it's all about excellence but it's not excellence alone it's a lot of things it's excellence with the speed of change the ability to be excellent on a continuous basis and to give up some stuff that is not working is so a uh, critical and therefore today it's not only about alignment but it's about aligning and being agile hand in hand and that is the reason you know it's so very important in organizations to really convert that culture and align it both the way the external world sees it and the internal world sees it see excellence is in the eye of the beholder it's in the eye of your customer you can say you know and in, in my context it's the best research report but if the customer doesn't think so it isn't and it's so important to take that feedback feed it back into the process and change it is basic so agile is basic basically and uh, the reason i say this outside inside alignment is so important is because, because without that we're going to go nowhere and in that sense uh, where agile succeed or where leaders leadership companies are agile they win is when they have this ability to have continuous listening okay listening to the customer listening to the internal teams being able to make those decisions very quickly check whether that decision is playing out delivering the right result uh, definitely it's about taking effective speedy action and very important uh, you know people are in this action mode i always say please stop to think whether that action is the right one and also it applies to decisions there can be decisions and there can be decisions it's about the right decision and that continuous feedback loop around a uh, check back and hence i will oh, okay i think i missed a slide so uh we'll we'll go to this it's about you know when i was talking about what sits between agile failing and succeeding it's really the whole unlearn learn relearn and i really think you can't learn till you unlearn because every time you're learning you're looking at it with that uh, colored lens right or with that bias and therefore your fresh perspective will not come and i really love this quote of alvin toffler because he says that the illiterate of the future are not those who can't read or write but those who cannot learn unlearn and relearn and if you think of some of the best leaders that all of us follow they are not always you know the harvard and the stanford uh, and the wharton masters right bill gates everybody knows was he 
in that league? Is there anybody in this room who doesn't know Bill Gates? Classic example. And, um, you know, I don't have that as a case study, but Microsoft is a great example of agility in a very different way, and I'll talk about it. So let's just think about some basic concepts, okay, uh, between traditional thinking and agile thinking. Uh, for several years, you know, you saw a problem, you did everything, and all of us firefight. You know, uh, I, I know of a, a case where, and it's happening if any of you read the papers, about the so many loans that are not being paid on time. So we have the whole financial sector in a mess. What's everybody doing? Lots of firefighting, right, between regulators, government, banks, chairmen, including people who more made the decision are being sent to jail. But is it really solving the problem? So much time is spent on firefighting, and that's why, you know, that linkage between what firefighting achieves versus what planning achieves should be looked at into context. Because when you see a problem, or you ha are creating something new, don't jump right into it. It's very important to go through that planning process. Problem solving. I mean, I say this all the time. You know, what's the problem? I don't want to listen to problems. You should come to me with solutions. And that's a, uh, you know, that's also some of my biases coming because that's how I've seen my managers uh, tell me end of the day, it's also about how are you framing the problem? How are you helping the team to frame the problem? Are you converting it into little bites so that they can be really absorbed? And that's why it's no longer about just jumping into it. It's about, you know, learning, relearning that whole loop. Uh, technology, how many of us have blamed technology? I was ready to if the slide was not going to come on, by the way. It, it is one of my pet things, you know, when I go to the clicker and it's not working and I'm saying, oh, as always, you know, we, we have to depend. Come on. You know, man-made technology and not the other way around. And that's the reason it's around learning to work with technology. And, and why technology is so integral is because, you know, it, there was the industrial re revolution the machine age. Today it is the tech age and it's not going. Maybe there's some new thing which will come up, but tech is equal to what industrialization was or the machine age was, and, and that's the new reality, right? So that whole loop, traditional was performance review, today it's about an ongoing review. And then, I don't, you know, a lot of us are prisoners of a particular workflow. So the effort is not spent in optimizing as you go along. And that's actually a real uh, issue and a problem. And very important, and I spoke about ecosystems. I really see if, if unlearning or the whole loop around unlearning, learning, relearning is so integral to agility, survival, winning, as is collaboration and empowerment. We are in an interconnected world. And like I gave the example of the global financial crisis, probably there wouldn't have been crisis if people were comparing notes and collaborating. But in the context of organizations, two businesses within the company don't talk to each other because they are so busy managing uh, their own uh, business and teams that they neither benefit or learn or sometimes the same organization competes with each other in front of the customer. I mean, who's having the last laugh? The customer. Who's not going to pay you? The customer. Who's not going to buy you? The customer. Right? And that's the reason it's so important to really work together. and agility or 
agility and leadership is fostering that environment to promote collaboration versus competition. And to my mind, that's one big shift that I've begun to see. And you know what? Collaboration will not succeed if managers, leaders, people are control freaks. And I know that was a question that came up before around leadership effectiveness. Uh, very often, you know, when you become a leader, uh, you feel so powerful. You want to be the one that says yes, no to everything. But you're so far removed in an organizational context to that little problem that, let's say, the customer service officer is facing. You know, who's on the call. And imagine if that person, that's why chatbots are effective, because they don't have to go to this manager. There is a whole uh, loop that plays out very quickly and changes path. But in the traditional thinking, you have to go to your manager before you respond. By that time, the customer says this company has lost the plot. So it is about empowerment. And I would throw in accountability. The moment you can get your people to think about, yes, you're empowered to make the decision, but guess what? You are responsible. You are accountable. You cannot say, I took this decision, but it's somebody else's problem. It's so very necessary, because if you do not have this whole ecosystem, and I am a fan of ecosystem, even from a thinking perspective, because it just allows me to bring everything together, uh, progress will fail, and you will not be adaptive, agile, responsive. So in my book, what are the five steps to being an agile leader, and why do I call it Agile Leadership 101. Uh, True North, I think it's a very done term. Uh, but the way I look at it, if you started out of home and you do not know where you're going, I mean, you're not going to reach anywhere. So True North is just framing up that vision, right? Uh, there are companies that live and die by this. And today, it's all about this vision and purpose being really larger than life. I think it's important so that you don't lose the plot in this fast-paced changing world, but it needs to be clear. And if I think about Toyota as a company, any idea what is its true north? You know, they are the first to adopt zero defect. Japanese are all about perfection. And it's perfectionism at every stage. And, uh, you know, the perfectionism at every stage and that whole thing about splitting up a whole uh, work chain, breaking it into bits, by the way, did not come through process. It came through the true north of zero defect. And everything else that followed was the process to achieve that true north. And that precision at every stage. Because the end product will not be zero defect if you did not have precision, perfection embedded at every stage. You know, this setting targets for every stage sounds textbook type. But actually, it's PDCA, plan, do, check, act at every stage, because it's the same thing. You tell them, you know what, I want this done. There's no check back. You're not reinforcing it. You realize it's too late. You're giving feedback last minute. And I catch myself doing that very often, because you're so caught up in doing things. And that's why it is so important thinking about collaboration, empowerment, and the whole learn, unlearn, relearn journey in any organization, to have these small teams that feel empowered about the work they do, and for that manager to continuously engage, to plan with the team so that there is alignment, to allow the team to do, to check, and that's where the next bit 
is very important. Checking can be done in different ways. But you know that humble management versus micromanagement is very important. Because nobody be, likes being looked over by the shoulder 24 by 7. So checking is not about saying, tell me how did you do it? Or you've done this wrong. It's about saying, you know, can we review? Which is why in the whole coding world, the whole thing about Scrum, the huddles, are so relevant and so important because they realized, gone, I mean, in the past, companies would say, I wouldn't pay you because, you know, this product, this piece of code doesn't do the job anymore. Right? And from there, organizations have begun to adopt it because they're also realizing that if they don't uh, break up each thing into sizable bites, you're going to be in for a bad surprise. And, uh, you know, one thing for uh, leaders, uh, because you have, you're, you're vested with a lot of power, you walk into meetings and, you know, kind of give feedback. It's terrible because feedback cannot be one way, it's two ways. And explaining, and which is why to me the individual effectiveness is very important, or one-on-one -on -one meetings. You know, after you find something's not working and you've said you worked, and this is a behavior thing. By the way, agility is behavior. Because any organization can set up these processes, but the people, the teams, if they are not coached, if it's not reinforced, it will not happen. And that's why continuous improvement. It's continuous improvement in the process. It's continuous improvement in the people doing the work, in the manager. That's how you have excellence. And that's how you have a relevant product. That's how you will be able to improve that offering. And in this process, customer is king. I don't have it on the slide because the customer is external to you, but it's integral to what you do. And therefore, I want to get straight into when I know how, how much time I have. OK. So we can go through this very quickly. Um, before I get into the case studies where I have there, I spoke about Gil Ga Bill Gates and Microsoft. How many of us had written off Microsoft? What about today? I mean, everybody, you know, lots of companies have gotten threatened, but if you look at what they've done, and you think of how AI and ML has played out in their strategy, they are squarely in the reckoning. And what did they do? They listened to the customers, they watched what competition was doing, they were humble enough to realize that the world had changed, they went into a collaborative mode, by the way, the number of startups they work with is incredible. It's part of their ecosystem. So that's a case study. And I have some very obvious case studies. I spoke about Amazon, the startup. Are they agile? Would you consider Amazon as agile? But you know what? Their leader doesn't talk about agility. Their leader talks about customer obsessiveness. And like I said, the customer is integral to what you do. So the fact that it's all about the customer, it stayed fresh. They started off as an online book retailer and of course threatened a lot of bookstores and guess what now they threaten everybody and what's amazing is they've embellished customer obsession with new technologies and if you look at their 
business mix today and what aws is now and netflix now is to their uh, business you know the whole uh, the the whole amazon prime uh, journey that they have and how they view competition they've no longer stayed with the brick and mortar their concept was books retailing then they said okay if we can retail books we can retail just about everything then it was about content and now it's movies and then it's about making the movies as well right then it's about powering what powers technology and that's how data centers have by and large become history in in organizations and uh, you know nobody in their organization talks about this agile cross functional mission focused team but that's how they operate and because everybody knows amazon so well i don't want to spend too much of time on it but best buy how many know best buy so this was a company that was going to be dead because of who amazon what did they do what did they do i know this slide is all about what did the leader do but very simple stuff they watched why their business was suffering they watched their competition very closely they understood their strategy redefined their strategy and said we will now they are customer obsessed but we will get closer to the customer we will get into their homes and we will become the showcase for everything that amazon wants to do because it's not in the brick and mortar business and guess what from a stock that was almost trading at 10 it's at 90 and obviously what went into it was a jail leadership it's about forgetting all that one had done in the past and what had made that company good because it was a hot shot company at one time it's all about collaborating it was about getting those teams it's about you know the uh, collaboration empowerment accountability the customer and you have success and in closing i just want to spend a couple of minutes on the crystal journey how many of you know crystal thank god otherwise uh, i'd have to take many more minutes and seek for more time uh, but how do you know crystal what comes to your mind when you think about crystal yeah you see that's the issue <laughs> to put things into perspective uh crystal is a leading global analytics company 70% of our revenues are non ratings come from global customers but we are very proud of our heritage of ratings so we started 32 years back a startup i feel proud to say that but i'm not young but the team at that time was a bunch of lot of enthusiastic people who had the vision by some experienced institutional uh, investors to say that you know things are changing all over the world uh, we are still in a fixed interest rate environment but if something has to change we have to begin to look at companies differently and crystal pioneered the ratings industry guess what we didn't leave it there we had growth ambitions so we needed to constantly look at what more the marketplace needed and the marketplace just did not need ratings they wanted to know what went into it and how they could do better which was how research was born and then we said we can't do everything on our own because we are a company that is driven to succeed we said well let's begin to look at acquisitions because it sometimes takes a long time to build and we started acquiring we bought in fact and that scaled up our research business and then we said why do companies in india only limit their playground to india if you are good make the world your playground and we took our capabilities global 
through another acquisition. And we were humble enough to say that maybe the best way to start is white label research. And then we went on to say we understand research, we produce ratings, we understand the business so well and we understand the risks and when what goes wrong, what happens. And that's how Risk Solutions was born. And we said that we have to, you know, get more in the global space and we acquired Coalition. And then we didn't stop there. Uh, you know, very recently, end 2019, literally before the close of the year or before Christmas, we announced the acquisition of Greenwich Associates, a global uh, data analytics and insights company, because we said, again, they've done a lot. We'll take, we'll do it. We know how to do it, but it'll take forever. And in all of this, from a culture perspective, we realized that we had to learn from every company, every team that came together. And there are some very simple behaviors that drive it each team, right? Customer, naturally, because who will buy if you're not focused on the customer? It's about the teams meeting daily. You know, the power of visualization. Tell me how many of you like text messages versus images and videos? You know, well, that visual impact works at work. Sending out long emails, long notes, long documents doesn't always do the job. It's about taking that flip chart, getting very visual, quickly coming down to the problem like you do in huddles. It's about measuring results through the process, solving problems, balance capacity. See, we are an intellectual capital business. A day has 24 hours, a person has that much capacity. That's true for machines, it's true for people. But most importantly, it's, you've got to get that right, because if you don't get your load balancing right, you will not meet timelines and deadlines. But there is one very important thing, which is about culture which is what we hold very dear at Crystal, And that's what makes the brand what it is. It has its roots and ratings, but it straddles to all our businesses. You know, every company talks about integrity being a core value, but at Crystal, it's about doing the right thing. Because try explaining integrity with a number of case studies, you can spend a lifetime. Tell a new joinee, do the right thing. How hard is it to understand? And if you reinforce it every day, and leadership walks the talk, you have the right ratings, you have the right research, the, you throw the right data like I did, when I told you I'm not an expert, and hopefully I've been able to give you a few insights. So I, in conclusion, I don't want to read all that's there in the slide. But I do want you to take away that it's a continuous process because you can only improve through change. And if you change frequently, it's equivalent of continuous improvement. It's about that whole learn, unlearn, relearn loop. And it has to be right at the top as well. And in doing so, you will find that things like business results and efficiency fall in line. They do, right? Because you know what your customer wants, you, you're checking frequently, you're aligning business strategy, you're looking at new ways to doing it, you're optimizing the process, efficiency is embedded in it. But every year, it's about thinking about the next year and year two, and year three. And that's the reason we always say at Crystal, strategy is a living process. Because what we wrote last year may not be relevant this year, so you need that frequent checklist. And the way to do it is very simple. It's plan, do, check, act. So thank you very much. I hope this has been useful. 
And my apologies for not being able to be able to share some great concepts or something with you, but this is the way I've experienced it. Thank you very much. Thank you, madam. Hello. Uh, thank you, madam, for the wonderful insights. I would request Pradhyan to please present a token of appreciation to madam.